take you home There is that sphere, monks, where there is no earth, no water, no fire, no air, no sphere of infinite space, no sphere of infinite consciousness, no sphere of nothingness, no sphere of neither perception nor non-perception, no this world, no world beyond, neither moon nor sun. There, monks, I say there is surely no coming, no going, no persisting, no passing away, no rebirth. It is quite without support, unmoving, without an object. Just this is the end of suffering. Namaste. So this is a wonderful sutra by the Buddha. And it came to mind last night, I was having a chat with Richard Clark, as I often do. <laughs> And the subject of books came up. He was talking about the Dalai Lama. And he mentioned that the Dalai Lama sometimes seems to hesitate, like he doesn't quite know what to say, you know. Uh, whereas his teacher, Nomi, never hesitated. He just spoke naturally, directly from the heart. And I replied that this is the difference between someone who is realized and someone who isn't. Someone who isn't realized is always going to be looking outside themselves for knowledge, referring to some book, some scripture, some tradition, some teacher, you know, something in the world that they use as a reference. And then Richard said, well, then why do we really need books, you know? Why do we quote scripture like that? And I replied, well, quite honestly, <laughs> it gives me more credibility in people's eyes. I really don't need to do it because I can see directly. And I call this reading from the book of life. In other words, life itself, existence, and the experience of existence are direct sources of knowledge to one who understands them. And that's the thing. They don't speak English or Sanskrit or Pali or any other language other than just being what they are. You know, the existence doesn't have to it doesn't have to explain itself or prove itself to anyone. It's not trying to establish a philosophy or a religion or a school or a community or a temple. It's not trying to recruit disciples. It just is what it is. But you know, in today's world, people are always looking for justification you're always looking for some authority to tell them what to think, what to do. And of course, this is trained into us from childhood, especially in school, but even before that, in family life. Listen to your mother, she knows. <laughs> so this is the experience we all have, that we are, we are rewarded for looking outside ourselves for guidance. But there's no need. Because everything is there before us, spread out like the fold of a newspaper. All we have to do is read it. And there's the rub, you see. Again, we've all been taught and conditioned to need words to express ourselves or to understand others. And words have their utility. 
You know, they're great for talking about things. But when we get beyond the range of things into the range of being, language fails completely. There's really no way to talk about these things except by making metaphors and similes. In other words, more or less poetic examples. And of course, these are always going to be limited by the limitations of language itself. So what is the problem then? Why do we think we need scriptures and teachers and gurus and all the rest? Why don't we just all read directly from the Book of Life? And of course, the answer is that we have been trained not to. We've been trained, instead of relying on our own intuitive knowledge, to look outside ourselves for guidance and authority and to take as credible those who can quote scriptures, you know, chapter and verse. And this is considered a religious person or a religious teacher. But the actual religious teacher is like the Buddha. He's not quoting scripture. He is the scripture. The scripture quotes him. You see, so that's the real enlightened one. He's not dependent on scriptures. He's not dependent on any authority or any tradition or any lineage, parampara or whatever. He's certainly not dependent on majority vote or having a large number of disciples or a big ashram or lots of money or any of that stuff. The really enlightened person is just looking right directly at life and saying, hey, this is what it is. So I wanted to quote from the Buddha, though, because so many people who are so-called Buddhists take it as an academic discipline that one has to go to school and learn so many things, you know, get word knowledge or book knowledge, and that one is measured or one's wisdom is measured in terms of them. How much scripture can he quote? How many suttas can he recite without, you know, looking at the book or even by looking at the book? Does he know how to uh, give a good sermon? And this is the thing. What is the sermon about? Well, it's about enlightenment. And what is enlightenment? It means seeing things or seeing life as it is. Well, so why not just see life as it is and talk about that? <laughs> This is why Lao Tzu said in his Tao Te Ching that one who speaks does not know, and one who knows does not speak. But in our modern world, what else can we do? The people who are interested in this thing, enlightenment, are few and far between. And the people who understand the language of transcendence are exceedingly rare. Krishna says, Manushyanam Sahasreshu, out of thousands and thousands among men, maybe one will have a taste for transcendence. And out of thousands of those, only one realizes it in truth. So this is the problem. How are we going to benefit the fallen souls of Kali Yuga by sitting quietly somewhere under a tree? <laughs> you know, it's a limiting factor for the exercise of compassion that if I was to just stand on a street corner and start speaking my truth or what I know to be true, people would regard me as a crank, 
you know, or maybe crazy or who knows what. But probably the last thing they would think is that, oh, this guy really knows what he's talking about. And the reason is, as we have discussed, they think knowledge resides in books. But the real knowledge is to directly look at life and see what is there. I love to give the example of Turiya. Turiya is the highest state of consciousness. It is the state of consciousness that has the other states of consciousness as its object. Waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. So, without Turiya, we would not be aware that we're aware. We would not be conscious that we're conscious. We are all in Turiya consciousness every moment even when we're in deep sleep. So why don't we recognize it? Why don't we see it? Because nobody ever told us about it. Nobody ever directed our attention toward it. Nobody ever gave us a practice by which we could separate the seer from the seen. Drishya huh? Vivekaha. And for this reason, people in general are not aware that they're aware, unless you specifically direct their attention to it. You know, I like to quote that story from Ramana, when somebody asked him, well, how do I know if I'm enlightened or not? And he says, well, are you aware? Uh, yeah. <laughs> are you aware that you're aware? Mm, yeah, yeah. So then he says, self is already realized. So there's no specific process that one has to go through to attain the self or realize the self. Self is already realized. So then why are we suffering? Why are we in ignorance? Why do we feel a desire to get liberated, or a desire for knowledge or truth? Well, it's because we have never really heard the truth. So we cannot recognize it, even if it's right in front of our faces, which it is. <laughs> so it's paradoxical, isn't it? Because we are in a state of ignorance and delusion, because we are covered over with desires, we have to rely on something outside ourselves, which Heidegger calls the friend. The friend is someone who reminds us of who we really are and what is really going on. And Heidegger says, quite accurately, the friend is simply a reflection of the knowingness within ourselves. But we don't know our own knowingness because it's covered over. This is the problem. So we get caught up in all kinds of outsider things. Gurus and teachers and religions and scriptures and philosophies and books and words, words, words. Huh? Mind is nothing but words name and form, perceptions, and words about those perceptions, and then words about those words, and so on. This is the trap. So to get out of the trap, all we have to do is recognize what is. Read from the book of life. See all these truths that we read about in the scriptures before us. That is the secret of self-realization. Happy New Year, everybody. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.